Hi everybody, before we get into the intro for this next episode, I want you to be aware that one, Maddie was out sick for this episode, so you won't be seeing her in this one, and then two, we were facing a little bit of internet connectivity issues or some lag. So if you notice that Trevor and I sometimes talked over each other, or maybe we're laughing at jokes that happened two to three seconds prior, that's the reason for it. I tried to go through and remove all of the pauses, but if you notice any, sorry about that, and we're going to get it sorted out for the next one. And we are live for Lowering the Barrier episode. I don't know what episode this is. This might be 14. And today, yes, it is. We're here with Trevor Zerke. I actually had to figure out if I was saying his name correctly. And it is. It's Zerke. And that is like jerky with a Z. So Trevor is a very unique chiropractor in the sense that 99% of his treatments don't involve actually doing any chiropractic adjustments. He has an audience over 240,000 followers that trust him to call out BS, give practical advice, especially revolving around pain management, including lower back pain. So if you fit the bill there, you're going to want to listen to this one. Trevor, hello. How are you? Hello. I'm doing good. Funny story. Actually, after you asked me that, literally the next day, I went and ordered food to pick up me and my wife. And the guy literally said, hey, I just got to ask you, how do you say your last name? And I literally said verbatim, it's just Zert. It's turkey. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. It's like verbatim. I was like, that's so funny because we just had that conversation. <laughs> You did turkey, not jerky. Yeah, you can use their interchangeable. They're both they're both pretty good though. Okay. So we have a lot of questions, Trevor, but first and most importantly, how are you doing? Anything new this week? Anything that you want to update the my audience on? Audience of like, you know, a couple hundred? Yeah. I guess a, a change of perspective for me today is we're filming on Monday the eighth, so uh solar eclipse day. I'm in Austin, Texas, which was actually like in the past. Yeah. And, you know, all week, like people were talking about it and like, oh, it's like this big deal. And I was like, how big, you know, it's whatever. I've seen one of these partial ones. We were in like the totality range. That shit was cool, dude. So cool. <laughs> I was standing out there like geeking dude, out. I was like, dang. That's it was, so, it was like Did black the, for like glasses, three minutes. Right? Uh, no. See, this is the part where oh like if gosh. we were did... like prepping, I would have. So what we did was we just <laughs> fielded it together because I was like, I know how these work, right? They're just really, really strongly tinted sunglasses. So we just got literally I have a picture of my wife. It's so funny. She's yeah. got like four pairs of sunglasses stacked and you can look and then you can see it. But when it was like fully <laughs> covered, you could just look right at it because it was just black. It was insane. Oh, my gosh. So was it like, how dark was it? Was it like nighttime dark? Yeah, like nighttime dark. But it's like weirdly kind of bright, the actual like outline of the sun. I don't know. It completely changed my view. I was like, wow, that was worth worth the hype. Like people came in all across the country to like central Texas because wow. it's in an area. And I thought it was like, eh, Man. whatever. But now I'm I'm a full believer. Next time there's a total eclipse and you can get to the area, <laughs> it's got my stamp of approval. We, <laughs> we had like 95% up here just in our backyard. So that was kind of nice. And we had the the glasses and it was pretty cool. But like seeing the, I saw some photos and videos of people who had the totality and that was like totally different. It was like dark here. It kind of had like a tint, almost like a, like a Western movie, but instead of it being like yellow or orangey, it was just like kind of a gray or black tint. It was really weird, but like to see it in totality, that's a, I think what the next time is in like 2030 or something like that 2033 or something like that yeah I'm well i guess sure. i didn't know i didn't know this but it all depends on like where you live right so i guess the last one that was here in central texas was like 45 years ago but they're not predicting another one for like hundreds of years so who knows but i don't know when like the actual oh, really? next i'm sure there'll be another one oh, well man. in terms of this era being like a total eclipse right so i'm sure there'll be another one sure. sometime soon but just, yeah. just texas won't be in it so but i might not be here so who knows could be somewhere else wow so Okay, there are a few, th there are a lot of questions that I want to ask you today, but I want to start all of this by kind of giving the the perspective of who you are and what you do. So Trevor is somebody, man, how do I put this? He doesn't necessarily agree with a lot of his profession's practices. Would you say that's fair, Trevor? I would say that's very fair. So you are a virtual chiropractor. Mm -hmm. How... Did that get started? What made you want to transition from in-person to virtual? And how would you explain your services versus a traditional chiropractor? Yeah, absolutely. So it it sort of happened with, I guess we can start with my philosophy and, and how I treat people and how that can actually transition. Because some, a question I always get is like, I hear that they're like, oh, you're a chiropractor. And I was like, yeah, but I don't actually see people in person. They're like, well, how does that make any sense? Like the whole job is you just adjust people. And I say, well, that's where it's a little different is just my philosophy instead of being, 
heavily reliant on manual therapy or adjustments and like the muscle work. Think of any time you go to a chiropractor, pretty much the stuff they're going to do. I don't base my treatment entirely around that. I instead take an approach that's usually people are like, oh, so more like a physical therapist. And I say kind of where it's a lot more of like rehab exercise and really treatments that we refer to as more active, meaning the people I work with, they're going to be doing a lot of the treatments like they're leading the leading the charge, so to speak, whereas instead of them just being passive and me doing stuff to them. So that's been my whole treatment philosophy since I was in school and since I got out of school. And so that kind of allowed myself to, when I started posting social media content and I got a few people who didn't live, you know, right next to me. And they're like, hey, well, I'd still really like to work with you for XYZ injury. Do you, do you think you could help me out or point me somewhere else? And I was like, well, actually... I, I don't necessarily need to be right next to you to, to kind of do what we're doing. It just kind of has to work more like an online coaching situation does. It's really no different than, you know, the difference between having a personal trainer in person versus just working with an online coach. You can still get, you know, 95, 99% of the, the same outcome. It's just a little different in the delivery. So I used to, used to see people hybrid where I would like, I'd work with people in person, but then I'd work with a different subsection of people not in person. And then there's a little bit of both where people had to work with in person once their, you know, complaints were mostly absolved, we'd, we just transitioned to an online thing. And that's worked out really well to the point now where all of, all of my clientele is online. So it's, it's essentially, it's an online coaching thing because technically legally speaking with my, with my chiropractic license that only, I only have my license in Texas. So people outside of Texas, everything I'm operating under isn't actually my chiropractic license, but I still take all my knowledge and understanding in the field and just base that around like an online coaching thing. And I usually work with people who've had long-term, you know, thinking longer than like four or five months up to, you know, multiple years of pain. Usually it's around back pain, but I've worked with a few other cases as well. And we help to set up sort of a long-term plan that not only like I can help them do stuff now, but more importantly, give them the tools to, to do stuff in the long-term. Cause that was my biggest gripe with why I sort of switched to the style I'm at was I didn't want to be a practitioner that, you know, every time someone got hurt, they thought, well, I have to go see Trevor now. Right. And it's like, as long as if something pops up, I have to go see Trevor in person and he'll fix it. I instead wanted to give people sort of the tools to be able to do stuff on their own and be like, okay, well, I, I remember what we used to do with Trevor. I know the principles. I know why we're doing what we're doing. Let me see if I can do it on my own. And for the most part they can. And I think that gives them a very valuable life skill of, you know, especially if you're active and you know, do you want to be active for the rest of your life, which sure a lot of people listening to this want to stuff's going to happen, right? Like, you know, knock on wood, we wish we could all stay like injury pain free. It's probably not the case. So I think being able to sort of absolve it and treat yourself, so to speak, and have that as like something super, super valuable. And that's what I try to base all my treatment around and using this sort of strategy or, or a uh, technique to deliver it brings forth that a lot, a lot more a lot easier than if, you know, someone just call, came and see me for adjustments and muscle work and then they left. Right. Okay. So now that you have this kind of virtual chiropractic business, take a step back. What did that look like? You know, graduating high school, deciding at what point did you decide that you wanted to go to chiropractic school? And then at what point did you start? Oh, there are two questions I want to ask here. First, what part did you start to kind of like separate or diverge from I'm going to say like the standard chiropractic, correct me if I'm wrong here, but like kind of the standard chiropractic method mm -hmm. into kind of creating your own method or just maybe disagreeing with some of those points and then switching from in-person to virtual. What kind of, what was the impetus for that? Yeah. So I, good question. Cause I think it is important to see like why the perspective of why, how I ended up of where I'm at. And the, one of the most common questions I get all the time is like, well, if you, you know, if you don't agree with most chiropractic, why are you still a chiropractor? Why did you still go to school, et cetera? And I always tell people it's because I didn't really know like the entire world. What most people think of when they think of a chiropractor wasn't what I initially thought of. And that's because I'd only seen two beforehand before I actually went to chiropractic school. So the first time was when I was in high school, I played sports. I remember one time I specifically played football, got hit pretty hard, had some migraines, went and saw a chiropractor, you know, like the normal thing, work on the neck muscles, et cetera, called a good. Thought that was like, I got some pretty good relief from that. And so I was like, oh, that's a pretty cool job. Like, you know, I would like to work in some form of healthcare down the road. My mom worked in healthcare. She's a nurse. And I was like, that'd be kind of, that could be a possibility, you know, down the road. Flash forward into college, 
I'd quickly decided one, I'm not nearly smart enough to go to like med school or anything like that. And two, <laughs> I don't think I would want to anyways. <laughs> like it's just, it just didn't seem like the vibe that I would want. So I was like, okay, so I'll look at other fields. And so it basically boiled down to chiropractic and physical therapy. Um, and then that's kind of where ironically I ran into my second experience with the chiropractor was I actually got really bad low back pain myself that lasted like five, six months and really limited sort of everything I could do. And at the time I went to see a chiropractor who would, he gave me a lot of the adjustments and stuff like that. And that helped for a little bit, but never actually helped a lot. But I did like the experience. It was like, it was like nice and short. I got to know the guy pretty well. He, he was good at like giving me advice and stuff. And I overall liked the experience enough that I was like, okay, I'm still, you know, even though it's not working as good for me, I still, I still see the potential there. And then because of that injury, I sort of took it into my own hands of, you know, what can I do? on my own to help my low back. Cause it doesn't seem like the chiropractor thing's working. And I should, I should clarify, I'm from Minnesota originally and physical therapy in Minnesota from my experience was, was never like, it was only something you did like after you went to surgery and stuff, right? Like they were pretty much all based in the hospitals and clinics. So it wasn't like something I was like, Oh, I hurt my back. I should go to mm. physical therapy. Like that wasn't really anything that popped up in my mind. Cause we didn't really have a whole lot of private physical therapy. Mm. Whereas now in Texas, there seems to be a whole lot more. And, you know, maybe if I was down here, be different road. Maybe I would have ended up in physical therapy school, but I started doing my own sort of like rehab and exercise and stuff. I was finding on YouTube in, in coordinates with what I was doing with at the chiropractor's office. And that finally seemed to be start working after a long time of like trial and error. I sort of actually figured out a way that I was starting to get a little bit better. I was getting a little more function. I could actually go back to the gym and do stuff that I wanted to do versus just the rehab stuff. And that sort of gave me the idea. I was like, well, I think if I, you know, I don't think just this alone. I don't think just this alone are good. Maybe if I combine the two, that could be really good. And I was like, maybe I'll just, I'll go to school, be a chiropractor and then I'll just do it that way. Right. So in my mind already, before I even walked in to chiropractic school, I knew I wanted to do some sort of model like that, where instead of, you know, seeing people for five, 10 minutes, just adjust them and then leave. I'd want to do like a more full on, you know, maybe do some work, then move into some like long-term rehab plans and go from there. So that's, that was like my philosophy already when I went to school. And then I got to school and I quickly learned that that is not how <laughs> the majority of chiropractors or kids going to see a car, go to chiropractic school, think of the profession. And so I was already a little hesitant when, when most people were talking about, you know, their sort of stuff. Cause I was like, well, I firsthand one had seen that and experienced that. And I didn't really like that experience of just, you know, walk in, get adjusted, leave, do that repeat for the next three months. Right. And then I also, my undergraduate degree was in exercise physiology. So I had to do some degree of, you know, scientific research and, and reading evidence and stuff. So I had a, a good science background that when I started hearing some claims that we'll just call a little outlandish in chiropractic school, I would see if there's any evidence and there'd be hardly any, mm -hmm. if, if very little. And so that already was, you know, raising eyebrows in terms of, you know, what to what do I think I can make out of the profession as well as like, what is this actual profession I'm getting into? But by that point I was already in. And I, again, I already had a plan of what I wanted to do. I didn't necessarily care as much about what the, the curriculum we were learning was under as long as, you know, as, in my mind, as long as I get the license and do what I want to do, that would work. But as I, as I just started diving more and more to school, you know, we just hear a lot of claims of, you know, what chiropractic adjustments can do, you know, all the sort of things it can treat and whatnot. And I just found myself disagreeing with that a lot more and more to the point that by the time I was almost done with school, there was like, there's very little things I agreed with in school, but I, again, it didn't really affect me too much. Cause I knew the way I was going to practice, was going to be a lot different, but then flash forward to when I'm actually out of school and making content and stuff, I just, I would bound to get a lot of answers. Cause I would, I would talk about the way I practice and people are like, why aren't you a chiropractor? Shouldn't you do X, Y, Z? And be like, no, and here's why I don't. And to my surprise, the internet really seemed to like that when I <laughs> when I talked about that. So now I now I try to do a lot more because it does, you know, not only is it kind of fun to poke at fun at how ridiculous some of the stuff is, but also I've seen I've gotten probably hundreds, if not thousands, of messages of people being like, either one, this was my exact experience of bad experiences at chiropractor. So I appreciate you talking about it and giving people uh insight on it so I don't make the same mistake, or the opposite is where people you know, they were really interested in seeing a chiropractor. They had gone and seen one like initial consult and, you know, they'd heard all these X, Y, Z claims that I was, that I was talking about to watch out for. And they're like, thank you so much. Like, you know, I'm, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to try to do, you know, stuff on my own or just wait and see. And that's really why I try to do a lot of the content that I do on TikTok and whatnot around that is just because I've seen, 
I, I've been in the world of chiropractic. I sort of know the language and everything there. And I know how it can be sort of weaponized to take advantage of people. So I try to talk about that as much as possible. So since you've had this experience, but like you've, you've come out the other side of it, you know, you have the knowledge to kind of know like what's right and what's not. I feel like hindsight 2020, it'd be very difficult still to say that like you would go, maybe not difficult to say that you would or would not go physical therapy or chiropractor because you've made this, you know, a very, very lucrative career for yourself. You enjoy what you do by the looks of it. What would you say for like somebody who's just now getting into it? Like, let's say they're in college and they're kind of debating between chiropractor or physical therapy. Do, would you steer them any direction or is it still like, eh, depends on your goals? Yeah. No, it's a good question. I actually, and I get this question a lot from kids who are, you know, they're either in college and they're going to a chiropractic school or they're already in it and they're trying to make the decision. And it's funny enough, and that people, people like to make them out to be totally different things. And I guess, you know, depending on who you see, they are. However, something that surprised a lot of people is we actually have the exact same scope of practice, you know, so depending on, you know, if you're going to go into a private practice versus a hospital, it's a little different there. Like chiropractors don't really see like acute care rehab or like anything like that, that physical therapists do. But if you're going to go, you know, Joe Schmo, I have my back pain, my shoulder pain. Should I go see a chiropractor, physical therapist? They can do the exact same things. So from, from a licensure perspective, like I always tell people it doesn't make that big of a difference. It just kind of depends on what you want to do and kind of how you want to be perceived. In hindsight, that's a good question. I always say I still like the route that I went because it made me had to, I had to do a lot of, you know, self-learning and, and that means finding a lot of really good mentors online and social media and stuff, reading a lot of like high quality literature and research and experts in the field talk about stuff. And that made me had to work a little bit harder. So I think I got more out of that versus if I went to physical therapy, you know, the curriculum's a little bit better. Um, not great still by any means, but the, it's still a little bit better. And I don't know if I would have had to work quite as much, but then on the flip side, physical therapy is usually about half a year, less, a little less money, a little bit more well accredited. I guess I'd say under like the general public, like people tend to think, you know, if there's a hierarchy, physical therapists are above it, which I, you know, maybe who knows. So there it's, it's hit or miss. I, I don't think I would change my path personally, but when a lot of people ask me, I, I do ask them like, you know, what are, what are your goals? What do you want out of it? What are you trying to do? And then I'll try to steer them in one direction or the other. So your viral post, which had one of them, you've had multiple at this point, but one of them had 6.8 million views on TikTok, which was pretty crazy. And it was where you called the majority of your profession a scam. I'm going to use air quotes here. How did not only your peers, which I'm sure your peers were a little bit frustrated by that, but how did your clients also you know, kind of react to that at the time if they saw it? And how did that video change the projection of your career? Yeah. So funny enough, I always when people tell me about this video, which I should pin it to my TikTok. So if, if anyone wants to see or wants to go look at it, but it was essentially, I was just talking about how majority of the things chiropractors or most chiropractors tell you just aren't, you know, factually, <laughs> factually true. when we look at it in the data. So I was talking about things like, you know, when your back starts hurting, it's because your spine is misaligned and, and chiropractors put it back into place or you know, you get low back pain because your hips are one's higher than the other and chiropractors can fix that or nerve tension is, you know, the reason you're getting all your headaches and stuff and chiropractors adjustments will fix that and stuff. The reason I made that video initially, cause that was kind of the first time I like really talked, I will, I'll say talk bad about my profession was because I had an initial, I had a consult that day with someone who had told me they had, you know, they had back pain for like five, 10 years. And they had tried all these, all these things, including they were hesitant to book a, a session with me because they said, last time I saw a chiropractor, they told me all of those things I just said had roped them into like a $7,000 treatment plan and they got nothing out of it. And they were just like, I was so scarred by that, that I didn't, you know, I didn't want to go see another chiropractor, but you know, I, they, they'd known someone who knew me. And so they, they went and talked to him. And so I was like, just, that just made me so mad. So I saw like that little, you know. It was a trend at the time on TikTok of like that initial clip of like, what's a scam? And so I was like, oh, I can just talk about how shitty my profession is because I was already pissed off about it for that day when I did that. And so yeah, it's still like a mixed bag, like the reaction to it. And it's funny because it's like TikTok in a, or I guess say social media in a nutshell, where it's a topic that people feel very strongly one way or the other. 
where people who agreed with me felt very valid. They're like, yeah, hell yeah. I hate chiropractors. Like they're snake oil salesmen. I'm like, kind of, and there's other people who are like, I love my chiropractor. Like he's great. He helps me a lot. Like, how dare you say that? And I'm like, probably, you know, you're probably right too. It's like, you know, this is not, <laughs> it's not a definitive answer one way or the other. Um, but people just felt so compelled to answer it. So my colleagues definitely, you know, for the most part, and, now, and I, in hindsight, understandably, I'm like, yeah, I get, you know, why. However, at the same time, I think, <laughs> I think most people, you know, with context I've given now are like, okay, I get, you know, why you did it. And it's, and I really don't think I'm saying anything that bad in the video. I've made TikTok since that are much harsher, which I'm sure they also no. don't like. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's funny, no, my clients, a lot of the patients I was seeing, <laughs> they did see that and they thought it, and it wasn't anything new to them because when they went and started working with me, I explained, I had to tell them, I was like, Hey, I know, you know, if you didn't know any context on me, I was like, Hey, I know I'm a chiropractor, but the way I do it is X, Y, Z, you know, you're not just going to come and get adjustments. Heck, a lot of time, a lot of people at that time I was seeing, I wasn't adjusting anyways. Like there just was no, uh, like they didn't really see benefit from it. It didn't really fit the case that they were in. And so we just didn't do it. And so there was nothing they were surprised by, but I did get, I, I, it, it's helped my career because I did open up a lot of windows for the, for the online stuff. Cause I just started getting a lot of people like, Hey, you know, this is what's going on with me. I was going to go see a chiropractor. Could we hop on like a 10 minute call, like a consult? And you just like, tell me what I should do. And I started getting a lot more of those. And then that really sort of opened the window towards, you know, I was all of a sudden working with people as like an online coach in like <laughs> one, I had one person in like Delaware it was like my first one outside of Texas. And then all of a sudden I had one in Spain and stuff like that. And it was just like, wow, this is really cool. I think I could actually, you know, do this down the road. Let me put a, let me put a flag in that or a pin in that and get back to that someday. Cause this was summer of 22 and I didn't move to completely virtual here until, uh, but at the time it really opened my eyes to like, oh, I could actually, okay. you know, help a lot more people if, if the message gets out there and stuff, but it's still, it's still a funny video. I did just recently a video of like me re-updating it and I still feel the exact same I do feel about most of the stuff. However, something I always tell people, you know, if anyone's listening and they like to go see a chiropractor and they really like their chiropractor, I'm not talking bad about, you know, any one particular or chiropractic in general. Like, I think it's so individualized. And I think a lot of people would agree that because a lot of people would be like, oh, I saw a chiropractor, hate him. And I saw my next one and he's my favorite. And I was, and I always tell them, it's, you're probably seeing one that I advocate for, <laughs> the one that I like in terms of they're just a good person. They right. actually want to help yeah. you. They know what they can do. They, they, they know what their limitations are versus, and I tell people that's unfortunately not the majority of people, you know, those are a very small handful of chiropractors and why that is, I don't know. That's, you know, we could do a whole two hour podcast on, on sort of the, why, why the majority of chiropractors <laughs> are the way they are. And it starts with like the schooling and, you know, the sort of dogma that gets enlisted in a lot of people, but that's so it's a split, it's a split uh, reaction to it, but I think overall I'm very happy. Well, obviously I'm happy because it got me a lot of, it got a lot of eyeballs on my stuff, but I'm happy I made the video just because I think it is an, it's an important thing to get out there where it's a lot of people, you know, might feel like they had some hesitancy, but they didn't really know why. And I'd like to at least, you know, give them, you know, if you hear these things, if anything, it just serves like a good screener you can make when you go see a car park for the first time, or if they're talking about sort of things like that that would be something where I'd say, you know, it's slightly red flagish where they might not be a good fit for you in terms of like actually helping you a long-term, long-term goals efficacially, you know, like actually, actually going to be a, a good, a good source of your money and time. So one of the, one of the things you said the other day, and I just, I loved it. It was in a video you made and you said, instead of fitting the system to the patient, they are fitting the patient to the system. And that was in regards to a chiropractor who might not be, who's kind of in it for the money and not necessarily individualizing their care, kind of just getting people maybe into this maintenance routine or something like that, but really just kind of getting people through this cycle rather than, yeah, individualizing the care. So kind of in addition to that, could you extrapolate on that? And then also in addition to that, what other you know red flags could people be looking out for, for people who might be, I don't know, a little bit weary that they are seeing a chiropractor that might not be in their best interest. Yeah, no, great question. And I think it is an important thing of like, you know, at least having, because I still want to say I'm never in all the content I'm making, I'm never discouraging someone if they have back pain and they think a chiropractor help, I still think you should go, you know, it, you can find one who can actually help you. So I, I would, of course, advocate you to go see one, but it's important to know like, you know, what you should be looking out for. And in the video I talked about, some good signs or some, some signs to look out for is if it looks like everyone is getting sort of the same 
treatment or they're all doing the exact same things no matter what they go in for. And that's when I referenced, you know, those, those chiropractic clinics are oftentimes making patients fit their certain mold rather than molding their care and their treatment to the patient. Cause everyone's totally different. Even if, you know, hundred people right now are listening and they all have back pain, every single one of those cases are going to be a little bit different, right? So the way I would treat someone with back pain is going to look totally different for all hundred people. Whereas a lot of these clinics are sort of set up to, I mean, their business at the end of the day, that's kind of like why chiropractic can sometimes get a lot of hand is just because it's not as strictly regulated as say like a hospital or other stuff like that. And these, these at the end of the day, they're businesses and they need to make money. And unfortunately the easiest way to do that is just to see more people. Anytime you need to get more volume and whatever it is, they just need to, they need to get systems in place. And unfortunately those systems end up being like the actual treatment. So people will often come in They'll only see them a chiropractor for five, 10 minutes. They'll just get the adjustments and then maybe they'll go do some electrical stim. We you know where they put the pads on and your muscles start jolting, or maybe they'll go on these roller beds and they will be like a, a, mach a machine that's massaging you like a self massage chair. And then they'll leave and that's kind of it. And they do that every single time. And if you look around, everyone's getting that same exact treatment. And the reason everyone's doing that isn't because those things are like so magic and everyone needs to be doing. It just makes it incredibly easy for the chiropractor and the employees in that business to just shuffle people in, send them to this stage, send them this, send them to that, and then probably bill your insurance because all those things are, are billable to your insurance if people are, or if people are paying with that. And I just think that's so sad that if you have a real problem of something you've been dealing with for a long time, if you're just boiled down to doing these three things, because it's most efficient for the chiropractor and their business, and it's, it's probably not going to work for you. And then you just end up in this position where you're like, well, crap, it seems to be working for all these people because they go all see this person, you know, is my case just that much worse? Am I doomed? Am I ever going to get some help? And that's what I always say. No, you just didn't. <laughs> you just got some really bad care, unfortunately. And they, and they just weren't actually doing the things that was best for you. They're just doing the thing that they do for everyone. And unfortunately for the most part is a lot of people do go to places like that and they think they're seeing results, but really it's just, they probably went in because they didn't have anything that serious you know, maybe their back started hurting a little bit. And if truth be told, if they probably waited a week, it would have went away, but they got nervous and they went in and saw them and, you know, they get sold this whole, oh, well, you know, if we look at your x-rays or your posture, it's all bad. We can fix that though. And we do this and they run through this thing. Sure enough, a week, two weeks later, they're better, but it wasn't because anything the chiropractor did. It was just, you know, they got better over time, but they did all these, you know, bells and whistles and they think that's what worked when really it's just kind of all this big show. And, and, and so that's, I always tell people to kind of look out for if, you know, if you walk into an office and there's a ton of people already in there, you know, a lot of times people are like, oh, if I got a restaurant, it's full, that's good. I would say the exact opposite for a, for a chiropractic office. I would not want to walk in and see 15, 20 other people there because realistically, I, if I had that many, like, I would not even know what to do. You know, at, when I was seeing people in person, the max I could see people, I would, could see eight people a day and that was it. And I thought that was like, you know, a good quality amount of care. I could not imagine seeing, you know, some of these places see a hundred plus people a day. And all that tells me wow. is that all those people are getting really, really low levels of care that is not personalized whatsoever. So I, that's, that's, that's like one thing I would look out for is if you want to go see a chiropractor, just sort of scout out, you know, how many people are going there at a time? Does it look like everyone's doing the same thing? Are there like 50 people that work at this big clinic? Just because that might tell you that they're just need more hands to get more people in all the time. And those, those are sort of the, like the main red flags I look out for. And then of course, there's all the other stuff in terms of, you know, shady practices. Are they trying to lock you into these long-term plans? You know, are they making you do all these x-rays and sell you like, you know, I always tell people, if you get like the same vibes, when you go buy a car and you're like, I don't really trust this car dealer. Like, it seems like, you know, the shady used car salesman that like trophy, <laughs> no offense to car salesman, but if you're getting that vibe from a chiropractor, that's really, really bad sign. <laughs> Cause it should not, it should not be like that. They should want to just help you and they shouldn't have to like sell you on, Oh, I'm going to help you because of this, you know? So with, okay, that's a chiropractor, like a used car salesman. That's good. So it feels like this industry is you know, divisive. And I know you've mentioned that, especially, I mean, maybe not like the industry, but when you kind of swim against the current, as opposed to maybe the majority of other chiropractors, that's a little divisive. So not to put you on the spot too much, but like, let's say you could encourage a big change in the chiropractic in industry. What 
would that look like? What, what changes would you make in order to make the majority of your profession a little bit more, I don't want to say like ethical because that's calling the majority of your profession unethical. And I don't feel like I can personally say that, but what, what would you, what changes would you want to see personally? Yeah, no, that's a good question. And I think, and I wouldn't even think I would personally call the majority of the profession unethical. Cause I don't think there's like when, when, chiropractors are sort of practicing the way that I don't really like a lot of time. It's not intentional from a set of like, you know, I know this doesn't work, but I know it can effectively make money. So I'm going to do it. It doesn't really stem from that most of the time. So I don't even call it unethical. I sort of just call it like ignorance to, to current literature and, and what, you know, the best practices look like now. But if I could change one thing, it would just be really the, the, the change in mindset of, you know, how can I actually help the, the whole person in front of me? Instead of a lot of, a lot of the times, you know, chiropractic gets boiled down to is like, they just look at people as, you know, parts and like, you know, they walk in, oh, they have a bad back. How can I fix their bad back? I can adjust it and it'll feel better. Right. They don't actually take into account like a full person. And that, that might be more my bias because I, I specifically work with people with like longer term issues and, and that kind of, you just, you have to take an approach that takes in, you know, all their lifestyles, everything that they do in a totality versus like, oh, their back hurts me if I rub it or crack it, it'll get better. I think that it's just often, oftentimes patient care in this profession is just oh, too simplified to, you know, they have neck pain. I'm just going to adjust their neck and it should get better. That's just really, it's just low, low quality care. And I think if, if it was just more emphasized that, you know, dig deeper, really look at other factors besides like, Hey, if I just adjust them, will it get better? You know, try to do more than that take a little bit more time and really dive deep and, and try to get to know and treat the person in front of you versus just, you know, you know, they have back pain. I'm going to follow this exact protocol we do, which is just, you know, these three adjustments and then, you know, maybe work on the muscles a little bit more. I think if, if it just did that, a lot more people would have a lot better, I guess a lot more was sort of looking for, they just have a lot better outcomes in terms of you know, actually trusting the chiropractor that they're seeing and really understanding or at the chiropractor having an understanding of, of the person in front of them instead of just boiling them down to something so, so simple. Um, but that's, it's a tough thing to say, you know, how you could make that change the profession. Cause I really think that stems from, from the philosophy of why people are doing what they're doing. Uh, and I think a lot of times when people get into chiropractic, it's sort of, cause they like the aspect of like, you know, uh, I'm treating people with my hands. I can fix everything with my hands. Um, in a lot of cases, it just doesn't need to be, you know, like I said, when I work with people and a lot of people, a lot of the colleagues that I talk to a lot, you know, manual therapy ranks very, very low in terms of, you know, what we actually do for treatment, just because it doesn't, one, isn't really that necessary. And two, it can kind of help you guide you more towards the fact of like, you know, instead of looking at it, what can I do with my hands? You know, how can I actually help this person? with all other aspects uh, of their, of their life that could be influencing their pain. That's very interesting. I always hear that pain is multifactorial, but to be honest, I, I don't really totally understand what that means. Like I understand like, conceptually that there are many factors that go into pain. Like I understand it from a definition perspective of things, but hearing somebody, you know, I don't know, would you consider yourself like a pain management specialist? Would that be like a reserve title? Is that something you'd consider yourself? You know, I know that you've helped a ton of people get out of pain. So what, I guess, what are some of the things that you would do to help somebody get out of pain? Like, let's say, let's say lower back pain, for example, that, you know, don't involve those manual adjustments that you you might not do as much of anymore. Yeah. I, I guess I don't know if I would I guess when you break down, like, what do I do? It kind of is like a pain management specialist makes it sound like I'm a lot smarter than I am. I promise I'm not, but I guess I would kind of say that. <laughs> and to answer your question on like, you know, what does it mean when, you know, pain is, is multifactorial besides just the, throwing the definition back to you, it just means it has a lot of factors. I, it really is more of a philosophy of, again, sort of what I was talking about, of how you look at it instead of breaking down someone's pain to just being, you know, okay, let's say your mid back hurts. And a lot of people would be like, oh, well, it just means you have, you know, it's probably this one, one muscle in your back is really tight, or maybe this one's really weak. And that's, what's causing your pain. When they've looked at it in literature, uh, it just never, rarely, rarely does it ever boil down to something that simple, you know, unless you have something actually like extreme, like, you know, think of 
broken bones or fractures. Obviously, that is what's causing your pain because you have something like that. But in a lot of these cases, that's just not how it is. So when you look at, you know, what are instead of things that are like specifically influencing that back pain, you have to take a step back and look at everything that can just influence pain in general. So that's where you start looking at things like like stress management. So, you know, are they actually sleeping well or is their diet and nutrition really good? How's their actual overall stress throughout the day? What's their mental health like? You know, all of those things can influence how our body perceives pain and can make things worse or better, you know, depending. So taking an approach that you're actually, you know, making the person understand that more importantly, you understand that and can take that in consideration, um, you know, to give you a little peek in, you know, when people talk to me and they're like, you know, my back hurts, it started hurting when I do this, you know, why does it hurt? And then I'll be like, okay, well, then we'll dive into a little bit more deeper and then come to find out, oh, well, actually, you know, they just, they just started this new role at work. They're really stressed out about it. They've been working 10, 15 hours more a week for the last two months than they have before. That's really making them a lot more anxious. It's making it harder for them to sleep. Their diet's gone down. They're not going to the gym as much. So when they are going to the gym, they feel like they have to push it really hard. And I look at all of those things and mean like, okay, it makes sense to me why, you know, an injury popped up and why it's, it's lingering for so long versus if I was just like, oh, well, your back pain started when you were squatting. Is it maybe because your hips weren't strong enough to do it and your low back take over it, right? You know, now it's totally two different paths of how are we actually going to approach your low back pain, right? Do we just address your hips and make them stronger? Or do we look at all these other factors that are definitely <laughs> influencing your low back pain? So when I work with people, I really try to look at things like that. And obviously, you know, because a lot of stuff I do is rehab based, we're going to work on stuff like that. But it's, it's very rarely from the sense of X muscle weak, make it stronger, Y muscle tight, make it not so tight, right? It's almost never from a case like that. It's, it's more so a lot more complex than that. But then we're also looking at all those other factors because they play just as much an influence, if not more of an influence. And I always try to make sure you know, if you understand that, that helps you give one, it gives you more context to, you know, why it might be going on. It gives you a lot more things to fix than just one thing, right? You know, because it can be hard to, you know, especially if you're in pain, it can be hard to really be on top of the stuff you're doing in the gym. So it's like, okay, well, maybe the goal for this week is just make sure we're sleeping an extra hour a night. You know, maybe we are hydrating a lot better. Maybe we are doing something at the end of the day so we can actually just de-stress for a little while and calm down. And that gives us a lot more stuff to work on in, in sort of coordinates with the other stuff. And so I guess from that sense, <laughs> what I do with people is it's a lot more like pain management because we try to do a lot more stuff like that. But yeah, I guess I, <laughs> I guess I would, I wouldn't necessarily say, say it's still like a, you know, like all those things are still going to get you out of pain. It's still, it's really complex, but that just might give you a little bit more insight of, you know, when people say multifactorial pain we're trying to look at all of these different things and take into account, you know, where they could play roles and, you know, how this individual in front of you might benefit from some of those things versus other things. And I think that kind of boils back to the point we were talking earlier of like, you know, what's missing with most people in chiropractic. If you're not looking at, you know, all those things could be vastly different for everyone, right. In terms of, you know, what would actually help them more and what's actually obtainable, right. Cause it's easy for me to say like, Oh, sleep more. Well, okay. You know, what about in a case like you and Maddie, you're about to be new parents. Like, I, I'm sure you would love to be able to sleep more once, once the time baby comes, but it's just not realistic. Right. So it's, what can we look at other factors, you know, that are more realistic and go through that. And that's just, that's a level of, of insight and care. I just think a lot of people are are missing out on. That was a phenomenal answer. And thank you for explaining <laughs> multifactorial pain to me. I, I think I like, I, again, I conceptually understood like, there are things that are, you know, like, but I really love the, the real life example of like somebody gets a new job and, you know, maybe they were, I don't know, on their feet or maybe they're just a little more flexible. Maybe they worked at home and now they're in an office and they're just like kind of like glued to the desk a little bit more. I think that's a super realistic, yeah, just example. Now, you know, when you're working with people, you are looking at all of these diff factors that go into what could be causing, you know, low back pain, for example, but when you moved from in-person to virtual, obviously manual adjustments were not really in the cards anymore. So for the people that are seeing maybe a chiropractor in person or maybe want to see a chiropractor in person, can you explain to them what role adjustments do and do not play? I know this is a really broad question, so I'm kind of, you know, just <laughs> throwing you a big one, but yeah, generally speaking. 
No, it's good. I'm comfortable. I've, luckily, this is like the most common question I get. So I've at least like learned how to answer it sort of simplistically. And it's an important one because I think this is, this is, I always tell people the difference between, you know, I, I still tell people most of them can go see a chiropractor. They like them if they just understand this one thing. And that is simply what is, what is the chiropractor doing for you? And what are you actually getting out of it? So in a nutshell, an adjustment, you know, you hear the loud cracking noise and everyone always assumes in a lot, unfortunately, a lot of chiropractors still go by this narrative that they're actually, you know, moving your spine and, and sort of realigning it and putting it back in place. Not the case, which is a good thing because that tells us our bodies are actually incredibly resilient and can't just be moved by other people's hands. And instead, all you're doing is, you know, I'm sure the, the, the age old, you know, all it's just is gas escaping the joint. It makes a loud, it makes a loud pop. And that's what everyone really likes, which is exactly what it is. But that can still feel really good for a lot of people. And I'm sure a lot of people listening, they're like, I've seen a chiropractor and they crack my back. It felt really good. You know, what was that? There's a lot of sort of factors that go into that, you know, you know, there's a, like on a psycho psychological level, you know, you've done it before and you know, a lot of people think it feels really good. So you're expecting to feel good. And then it happens and you hear the sound and you're like, oh, that sounds cool. This feels good. Wow. This is awesome. That can just help make it feel really good. But then from an actual like standpoint of, you know, when, when a lot more people in sort of the realm of like the evidence care have looked at the adjustments and, you know, why do actually more people get out of them? I almost equate it to more like a massage when you I almost think of like a, a massage, a really, really quick massage. And from the sense of like, it's applying a new stimulus to your body, you know, it, it can feel really good at the time. And then you can kind of take your mind off of the area that was in so much pain and that can just help you feel good. And then once you start to feel good, you feel a little bit more comfortable, a little more confident with, with what you're able to do with your body. And that alone can decrease the pain. And so a lot of times when I would still see people in person use adjustment, I would tell them exactly that. I'm like, Hey, you know, all this is doing, it could help feel really good. It might help take your mind off of things. And then we'll move right into the stuff that, you know, long-term will help you do more stuff, which is, you know, if I was working with someone a little more active, like move into a rehab that was based around like load management stuff. If it was just more of a day-to-day -day person, look at, you know, exercises that's really going to target to strengthen and then just help them move, move the areas that, that were in pain a lot better. But the adjustment can be a really valuable tool for actually just like letting them relax and feel a little better and take the pain off a little bit. However, it's very short lived. And, you know, that's why a lot of times I would just, if I would adjust people, it'd be right at the start and then we'd move into the rest of our session. And then, cause you know, they're probably not going to feel it two, three hours later. And that's why, unfortunately, a lot of the chiropractic offices are like, you know, we need to see you three times a week because, you know, it doesn't last forever. So we just need to do it more often. And instead, I would just say, why, if that's the case, why are we focusing on doing that all the time instead of just looking at some more long-term, something that has a little bit more long-term benefit? So something that you said, and I think this was kind of eye-opening to me, was this, and I, I, I don't know if it was you, if it was Aaron Kubal, if it was somebody else entirely, but one of you said, or maybe I heard it somewhere else, I don't know, but it was that the idea that we could move human joints like, like, like vertebrae with our hands. Think about, and you've played, you played football. Think about what would happen if like a linebacker ran into another person, like full mm -hmm. speed collision. I feel like the spine would just turn to dust if it was easy enough to just move vertebrae with our hands. So I, I always think that's, that's just an interesting kind of eye opener. Well, it's, I always tell people, it's one of those things where if you don't think about it, it makes sense. Right. Because especially when you like the context of like you watch and you hear the cracks and just like where your mind goes of like, well, why did that sound happen? Like something had to move for that, for that sound to happen. You're like, oh yeah, that probably does make sense. But then, yeah, if you just think about it for literally 10 seconds and you're like, wait, does that actually make any sense that someone with their hands that are <laughs> doing something that doesn't, for the most part, doesn't hurt. Right. If someone actually moved your bones and stuff, if you've ever had knock on wood, no one has, but if you've ever had a dislocated shoulder or something, they had to get that poke back in place. That hurts like a son of a bitch. Right. And when you go get adjusted, that doesn't hurt at all. So we would not be looking at, you know, oh yeah, it's definitely moving stuff back into place. But again, that is a good thing. We, we wanted to know that our bodies are very resilient and they can't actually withstand, you know, forces from people and stuff like that. So again, it's just, but that's where that's like an ultimate red flag to me is if a, if a chiropractor is sane or still telling people that that's what they're doing, that's just like so outdated. And if that's like the basis of why you're doing it, that just tells me everything else that, that you're probably doing 
I just don't trust because you're just not thinking logically or of anything that has a shred of evidence. Okay, two two things that may not have a shred of evidence as well. One, when I was really young, so my dad loves going to the chiropractor and he would take us as kids to a chiropractor. It scared the hell out of me when I was a kid because it felt like I was going to have my neck snapped. Like I, I, didn't, I didn't know. So I was really worried about that. But he always used, is it an, is it an actuator? But it's, it's that activator. like little like pen thing that they use and it's like click, 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 activator. That's it. So that, do, do those have a shred of evidence and those massage guns? And I know these are, these are sort of different things, but I figure if we're on like the activator slash massage gun, they're both like point and shoot kind of things. Do they have any evidence? And I think the, the, the idea behind the like a massage gun, like a Theragun or something like that, is that you're replacing one stimulus with another, but that's really the end of it. It's like putting ice on your toe when your elbow hurts. You kind of forget about, you know, your toe for a minute or your elbow, whatever one was in pain. But is that kind of what's going on or? Yeah, we, I guess we start with the activator one. Any evidence? Yes. Any good evidence? No, <laughs> because they've actually done a lot of the, the the research on their own and they say all this stuff. And it's just, it, again, it boils down to if we just think about it for like 10 seconds, it's a little spring loaded gun. And I know they'll say like you can, I get into people with this a lot. Chiropractors say not people, but you can make it stronger, of course, but it's still not like what at the end of the day, you're trying to move human bones covered in muscle, covered in ligaments with a little spring loaded gun, that's just not happening. So again, all it's doing is providing <laughs> just a little bit of stimulus to the area. But on the flip side, I actually, one reason, like, you know, a lot of people, when I make uh, videos on this, they're always commenting like, well, I like that doing it on my neck because it's not so aggressive and stuff. And I say, that's actually a good use of it, right? Is where you don't have to do, you know, if, especially if you don't like the really intense high velocity neck adjustments, that could be like, you know, something that feels good. But again, it's the problem with a lot of the stuff is just the narrative that's being used with it. Cause it's how you perceive what's being done is the outcome is very different. If I tell you one thing versus I tell you the other thing, right? So if I tell you, Hey, here's this little tool, it's kind of silly, but I'm going to click it on your neck. It might feel a little good and it might help you feel a little bit of pain relief right now. Is that cool? Be like, yeah, okay, cool. But you don't think it's a magic tool. You're just like, this is just a thing that's helping me feel good. Versus if I told you, hey, here's this little magic spring loaded gun. It's going to move your bones back into place. It's going to fix your alignment. It's going to give you perfect, you know, nerve communication and your whole body is going to be a lot better. You're like, whoa, this is crazy. You know, I need to come get this done all the time, you know? And that's where I sort of draw the line on it. However, at the end of the day, it is still just kind of a silly little tool. And I think, you know, could you do everything you're doing that with your hands? Yeah. But at the same time, I don't think it's like the worst thing ever. It is what I said. What's good about it is everything you can apply that to like, you know, the massage guns, whether it be like hypervolt, Theragun, whatever. Yeah, exactly. You're right. It's essentially you're able to give yourself a self massage that can feel good. You know, you can apply so much stimulus to an area that exactly like you said, your, your body just kind of goes numb to it a little bit. I always, the analogy I always use is if you ever got a bug bite and you start scratching it for, you know, you're going on hour two of scratching it the whole area in your arm, let's say it's on just, you kind of stop feeling it because your, your body eventually is just like, dude, I'm going to stop paying attention to that. Cause it just keeps that stimulus keeps coming there. It must not be that's dangerous. I'm just going to ignore it. And that kind of was what happens with massage gun, but that can be really helpful right you now before you work out and stuff like that. Like example being, I have one, I've had one since chiropractic school and my wife literally uses it every time before she goes across at class, even though I tell her, I'm like, Hey, you know, it's not the best, like you don't need to do that. But she's like, oh, I just like it. And I'm like, okay, that's cool. And it, the, you know, benefit, you can do it on your own. You don't have to go pay someone a hundred dollars to do it to you every single time. Although I did see that was a thing is that people are starting to like <laughs> big gyms, not to out lifetime, but I think lifetime has this where they like, you have to pay to use their hypervolts and stuff. I'm just like, is this where we're at now? So I would advise against that. But you know, if you have one around the house and stuff, I, I do think it can be a good, that in a nutshell can explain like everything about, you know, most chiropractic treatments where it's this little thing. It feels kind of good sometimes, sometimes it can be a little painful, but it kind of takes your mind off. It helps the area you're working on feel a little better for a little bit, but it's not going to make any long-term changes. You can apply that to pretty much everything chiropractors do with their hands or with little tools. If somebody were to get an injury, how would they make the decision between going to a chiropractor versus a physical therapist? Ooh, good question. First and foremost, I, I do always tell people it, it cause this is a realistic answer is it probably boils down to like financially is one 
more feasible than the other, right? Insurance plays a big, big factor there. A lot of, actually a lot of chiropractic offices have, are very insurance friendly where like you might have to only pay like a $20 copay or something like that. And I think that's why chiropractors see so many people versus, which makes physical therapists very mad. They get very mad that a lot more people go to chiropractors than physical therapists, <laughs> um, which I find kind of funny, but at the same time, so if it's the same thing, uh, it kind of depends. It really does. Unfortunately, it's, it's one of those things where I tell people you do have to do a little bit of research beforehand because there are still some very, I would say just poor care physical therapist clinics as well, because of all the reasons we said earlier with chiropractors, where it's the name of the game for them is just see as many people as possible and churn them in, churn them out. Right. I've had a handful of patients myself who, you and I explained what I do. They're like, okay, it sounds kind of like physical therapy, but I went to the physical therapy. I didn't like that. And I said, oh, really? Why would they do? They'd walk in, see the physical therapist for five minutes. They talk to him and then they get sent to an assistant who hands them a sheet of exercises and they do them on their own for 10 minutes and then they leave. And it's the same sheet of exercises everyone gets all the time. So if that's, you know, the option you're deciding, if that's the sort of physical therapy clinic you're looking at, I would advise against that too. It kind of really boils down to what I would say the severity of it. And this ties into, you know, should you go see one in the first place is you know, what happened that sort of caused, you know, the pain you're in, I, I always work with back pain. So we'll use back pain. For example, was, you know, the reason you're in back pain was that you just woke up one day and all of a sudden your back starting to hurt out of the blue nowhere. If that's the case, I always tell people, give it a couple days, as long as it's not something super extreme, see if it's gone away, see if it's got better. If that's the case it has, you can probably just skip all of them altogether and you don't need to see it. But if it is something really intense and you want to go see, I do think a chiropractor is a very easy barrier of entry. So it's relatively easy to go see one as long as you kind of do the screening process we talked about and making sure the, the red flags aren't there. But if it is something you've been dealing with for a lot longer, let's say it's, you know, you go to the gym, your back started hurting, you waited a few days, but it didn't really get a lot better. And then now you're on month two, three, four, and it's still bad, if not getting worse. That's where you would you know, start wanting to go see someone for like a longer term solution. And that's where I do think most of the times physical therapists are a little bit better just because I think the outlook is a little more realistic. And in terms of, you know, what they're actually going to do tends to be a little bit more like active approach versus just, you know, if you go see a chiropractor and that's the case, they're like, okay, well, if we just adjust it for the next three months, it should get better. And it's like, eh, probably not. And I just don't think that's a, that's a good use of your time or money. But I, I, I do think it kind of boils down to how severe is the injury, right? Is the pain really, really, in I shouldn't say injury, pain. If the pain is really, really intense, how long has it been lasting? How is it progressing? Do you have a history of it before? Is this the first time it's ever popped up? Or have you had an experience, you know, if you've had back pain before, that's, it's more than likely you're going to get back pain again. You know, how did that go last time? Was it something that lingered for a long time or did it go in a few days? And I sort of all those things can help guide your decision. But I do help tell people if you've never had back pain or you've only had like one or two occurrences with it and it pops up, it can be really scary. So I always understand that. Like people are like really concerned, like, oh God, I, I need to go do something. Just if you can give it 24, 48 hours and just see how it progresses. Try to stay moving. Don't just like, you know, I always think it's funny when you think of like, you know, our parents or our grandparents when like I threw my back out and like, okay, what'd you do? And they're like, I just laid in the bed for the next three days. And I was like, that is like the worst advice I could ever think of giving someone, <laughs> you know, I still try, try to stick to your daily routine as much as possible, just modify it and then see, see how it's going. And if it persists longer than that, then I think that could be a situation where, you know, you want to start, start looking towards someone. And then if it persists for a lot longer than that, definitely want to start reaching out to someone, whether it be chiropractic, physical therapist, again, if it's longer, I'd probably side more towards with the physical therapist, just because the average, like the mean, the mean physical therapist is probably better than like the mean chiropractor, but. <laughs> okay. So I have heard that everybody may have, and this may be so wrong. So just feel free to just laugh this one off, but does not, maybe not everybody have a degree of bulging disc, but that people with a bulging disc or multiple bulging discs could have, could like one, not notice two be totally fine. Three, not have to do anything about it. Are any of those statements true or am I like totally out of left field right now? No, you're absolutely correct. And I wish I had, I'm really bad. Aaron's much better. My friend, Aaron Kubel is much better about this. Me is he just like, 
has an encyclopedia of the exact studies in his mind at all times or has like a folder. I wish I had the exact one. So I give you the exact statistics, but you're totally right. In most cases, a lot of people who have, you know, disc herniations or disc bulges kind of not interchangeable in the science, like the evidence field, but for most common people, it's sort of an interchangeable term. So I use both of them. Most of them, either one, like you said, are like asymptomatic, meaning you don't, you have it, you don't even notice. And there's been a few studies of people who I used to work with uh, a lot of power lifters. So I looked at research involving people who did like a lot of really heavy strength training. And it was like, gosh, it was like over, over 50% of people who have done this, you know, long-term heavy strength training for, I think it was three, four, five years. Most of them at one point or other had a disc herniations. However, it was like 90% of them were asymptomatic. And they've done the same thing of people in nursing homes where it's, you know, once you're over a certain age threshold, it was like over 90, 95% of people in there had disc bulges or disc herniations. It's just a lot of them were really asymptomatic. And that goes on to tell us that it's, it, it's not something that we need to be as concerned with for the most part as, as a lot of people are in terms of like the minor, you know, normal small scale bulges. And so one, they're not something we need to worry about as much as possible. And two, it tells us to a degree that there's your body can kind of heal, heal with it on their own, which is something we're seeing as well as it doesn't need to be. It used to be, if you had this, you'd go and get like a micro disectomy or some other procedure done to fix it. And now a lot of times we can find as if, you know, as long as you can sort of manage the pain and kind of keep that at a low level, they should kind of clear up on their own. And I've worked with gosh, probably 10, 15 people, you know, in person and as well as a few people online who had, you know, a history of it. And that's, that's the exact approach we took, right? Where it's, you know, look at how are your pain levels with it? How can we manage those and, and kind of keep them at bay and then work around it to a degree until it starts to get better sort of on its own. And that can be very like widely varying. An example I always use is I had a young guy who came in, he was a power lifter. He had a herniation at L4, L5. His doctor literally told him to never lift like heavy weights again. He was like, well, this sucks. Like I literally compete powerlifting. And I love this. It's like my favorite sport. So he's really worried. And I told him, I was like, that's, I promise that's not the case at all. Like, you know, here's, here's everything we know. Here's everything we should do. And in fact, you know, if we work together, what we're going to do is we're going to start lifting again, just that, you know, we'll gradually work our way into it. And that alone, he's just like, oh, okay. So I can still lift. Like, I'm not going to like spheres in myself. I'm like, no, it'll actually be. I think it'd be good for you to do to have some, some sense of normalcy and build up your, your confidence a little bit more. And he went on, it was literally six weeks later from when we first met, he had a squat PR <laughs> six weeks later. And he's like, I had no pain while I did it. And I was like, Oh yeah, look at that. That's crazy. Oh my God. Yeah. So it's, 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 it's kind of crazy how, you know, that's wow. been such a big baddie of like, people hear that and they're like, Oh my gosh, this is really severe. Like I'm doomed. My back is, is really toast. And the more we're learned about it, just you're, we just, if anything, the lesson is our bodies are incredibly resilient to things like that. And a lot of these things we, we at one point thought were like really dangerous or, or really concerning. It's actually looks like our body can kind of handle those to a varying degree uh, a lot better than we thought. You know, I see, <clears throat> I know you have seen these cause I've seen these, but like the, the images or the videos where people will take like, it's like jelly or something like that. And they squeeze two discs together and the jelly like shoots out a little bit. And they're like, this is what a disc bulge looks like. And I've seen that. And it's honestly, thanks to people like you and Aaron that have debunked stuff like that, that I, that I even like had this relative idea that disc bulges might not be as serious as a lot of people make them out to be. Now, another thing that I learned maybe, maybe a year, year and a half ago, that is way overblown is posture. And people talk about the importance of like, you know, back straight, shoulders back, you have to stand. But like being in that stiff position, you're actually doing yourself kind of, if you were to hold it for a long period of time, you're actually doing yourself a disservice. So for the people who are worried about posture, could you ease their, ease them a little bit? Yeah. Absolutely. No, great. I love talking about this one too, because it is still one of those things that's it's marketed a whole lot. And I think that's, I talked to this for in a video and I think it's mostly because people have learned they can make a lot of money off it. Right. So, so it's one of those, like, they just try to keep pushing the narrative. Like, yeah, you got to always think about your posture, but no, we've done so much research on this topic and we found there really is no such thing as a perfect posture. This is sort of the catchphrase we always run. There's no such thing as a perfect posture. The perfect posture is a varying posture. What does that mean? It means instead of, you know, this, this position, right? Like this, that, that we were so ingrained to as kids, like we have to be like that as, as long as possible. It should actually be a posture that's sort of always changing. We never actually want to be in one position 
too long versus the other. Right. So that, that can mean either like just a hunch over. I don't want to be like this all day, but I also don't want to be like this all day for exactly like you said, a good analogy is if you've ever done like any sort of isometric cold exercise, imagine if you did that all day, like that would kill you. Like you would not like literally kill you, but like your muscles would be absolutely zapped. <laughs> you'd feel so sore. You'd feel so, so crappy the next day. Um, and that's sort of the same thing where right? when I hear people just being like, oh, you know, you should be sitting up at your desk. You know, if you work from home or you work at a desk all day, you should be in this position all day. And I'm just like, no, one, not realistic because it's incredibly hard. Your muscles are going to get fatigued. You're going you're to go out of alignment. And it's just causing people to be really worked up and stressed about a thing that they don't really need to be. So instead, what I always tell people is you don't really need to necessarily be like, okay, I can, I have to sit like this for 60 minutes and then I can, you know, maybe do something else. But it's instead of just, just try to be moving throughout the day, right? Ironically enough, a good example of that of, of two things of being able to move all day and then people making money off of a thing that's overblown is like, I have a sit stand desk here. People often equate like why a sit stand desk is good is because we should be sitting for like eight hours because that's bad for our posture. That's not bad for our posture. Why I like it and why I recommend it is it just gives me something that I can like easily like move. So I don't have to sit, you know, like maybe one, like every hour or two, I'll just stand up for like 20 minutes, but I can still keep working. And that's good for me. It's not just because sit standing is so much better for my posture than sitting. It's just because I actually like moved, right? Uh, it, it's no different than, you know, if you were to sit on the couch all day and you just sat like lean back, right. And you weren't, you didn't want putting any stress on your muscles or anything like that. You're still going to be incredibly sore. And it's because you didn't do your body was in this fixed position for so long. And you never really do that. And that can go the other way too, where if you were sitting like this, watching TV for the next eight hours, that's not inherently better at all. If anything, it's going to make you just as uncomfortable, if not more, because you don't ever do that. So no, the posture thing is, is really overblown. And I, and I always tell people it, it's just an easy sort of cop out, you know, whether it be a chiropractor or whatnot, it's just an easy thing to point out and you can be like, oh, it's because you have poor posture. Everyone, you know, from the mindset of what we think is good posture, because it's what in, was ingrained to us at such a young age. No one has that. So it's easy for me to anyone who walks in be like, aha, you have poor posture. That's why all your problems are here. Like, no, that's not really the case. It's just something that it's a very, like the lowest of low hanging fruit for a lot of people. But the thing is, it's irrelevant. So I don't, it's a dumb low hanging fruit at that. <laughs> so yeah, one of my, one of my, one of the things I really liked hearing about that was, I think it was from Nick Oh, crap. I don't remember his last name. Lamelli, like Lamelli, something like that. But anyways, he said the best posture is the next posture. And I just, I really like that. Now, the other thing it's that we started talking about right before the uh, episode started was acupuncture. And I don't even know the right question to ask you. So broadly, it was helpful or placebo, but it sounded like you had a lot to say about this topic. So Anywhere you'd like to start on this, I, maybe from the perspective of like, if there was somebody you knew who wanted to go and get acupuncture or dry needling, maybe explain the difference there. If there is one, what would you tell them? And what would be like your recommendation potentially instead, if you have one? Yeah, it's, it's, a, and I always tell people I'm not an expert on acupuncture. I was I know a little bit more because it was sort of intermingled. My school actually that I went to had both a graduate program for chiropractic as well as like acupuncture, which you actually get like a full on, you know, three year degree. And well, it, it kind of, I don't want to, that, that simplifies a little much. They cover a lot more than just acupuncture, but acupuncture is sort of based on that, but it's, it's sort of loosely around Eastern medicine approach in general, which involves a lot of acupuncture. So I know, I know about it more than, than I'd like to, but I always still tell people I'm not, I'm not an expert in it. But if, if someone were to ask me, you know, I have, I have this, you know, hip or glute pain and I want to get acupuncture done, you know, should I go do it? And I always tell people, you know, what are you, what are you trying, looking to get out of acupuncture in the first place? Do you think it's just some magic sort of thing that's going to, that's going to fix it entirely? Are you just curious and you want to try it? You think it'd be helpful or do you think it's just sort of, re sort of relaxing and you like the, the idea of it? Cause those are two sort of three different things on the front of, are you looking for it to get like, fix all your pain and stuff? No, I, you know, it kind of falls under everything else we've talked to where I just don't think there's very little evidence showing us that it's going to, you know, fix long-term pain like that. It doesn't seem to be an effective because it's not really changing anything tangible we can see in the body. And it's just, I would think it's an a poor approach like that. 
if it's something you're curious in and you think it could just be kind of generally relaxing, I'm not going to like deter people away from that because it does fall under the category of kind of like <laughs> the woo. I, right. I have, a, I have a patient who literally she, you know, she vibes with everything I say, but she still likes going to see her acupuncture. She goes, well, it's just part of my woo woo thing. And I'm like, yeah, you know, it kind of is. So if you fall <laughs> under the category of like, you want to see that and go for it. I'm sure it would be something you'd be really interested in. And that's sort of the side I never really like to talk to because that can go into like, you know, spiritual, all this stuff. And I'm just not, that's not my cup of tea. However, I will flip it to the other side of what you said <laughs> is dry needling, which is in, in essence, if you've ever heard the two things, you're really confused by them. It's the same practice of they're using these little sharp needles and they're putting them on certain points to hopefully relieve pain. That's where it's a little different from dry needling and acupuncture acupuncture, they'll tell you what they're doing is not sort of just all around, you know, sort of resolving pain, dry needling it is. So they're saying, you know, we're putting it here to try to relieve muscle pressure or stimulate this and do X, Y, Z. And in terms of if, you know, I had a lot of pe people who came to me when I was working in person who wanted me to do it. And I'd be like, eh, that's never been my cup of tea. So I never got certified in it, uh, but there's other people you can go to. And I'd ask them, you know, why do you like that? And, and it kind of, <laughs> the way I always came to it was if, if someone's like, you know, I kind of want to get it done. Do you think I should do it? And I'll always ask him is like, well, do you like really sort of intense, intense stimuluses? Meaning like when you go get a massage or if you have a massage, do you like someone to be like kind of nice and relaxing or do you like to then just dig in there, you know, and kind of to a degree, make it hurt. And you feel like you get relief from that because some people do. That's sort of where I, where I put dry needle and where it's for the camp of people who like, it is such an intense stimulus because they're quite literally stabbing you with very long needles. I think some people would be very surprised at how long some of those needles are. And it's creating this really strong, intense stimulation. And that can, you know, for the reasons we talked about before, where your brain just can't process, you know, you know, all of a sudden it's getting this stat literal stabbing pain in your back. It's going to focus on that more than like, you know, the sort of muscle aches you've been having. So people can get relief from that. But when you, when we look at the, you know, the evidence of, you know, how is that any different than placebo, it just isn't really there. So then I ask people, you know, if you, how much do you, how much do you actually like want to try it or are curious to be? Cause at the end of the day, it's like, it's stabbing you with needles. So like, that's kind of intense. And in my opinion, not <laughs> my first route I would go for trying to get some, some relief in, in my back pain or something. Um, but yeah, in terms of, you know, the difference between the two and what I deter, I guess that's where that's a good distinction. I do deter most people from getting dry needling. Cause I do think it's overblown and most people don't benefit unless you were like really one of those sickos who like likes your massages to be like painful, excruciating where you're like kicking and screaming. And then you're at the end, you're like, Oh, this was so good. Right. If you are one of those people, you know, maybe dry needling is for you for the vast majority of people, not the case. However, acupuncture is a lot more on the, like, yeah, I'm going to use my own patient's words. It's a lot more on the woo woo side. So again, not for me, not for most people I talk to, but if that is, you know, sort of the route you're going, maybe who knows? I don't like to, it's something we talked about before we started recording. I don't like to hate on something that's been like an important part of cultures right. for like thousands of years. Cause I truly, I don't understand that nearly as much as other people do, but I would not, it's not something, let's just say it doesn't make my recommendation list when people are like, Hey, what should I do for X, Y, Z pain? Acupuncture is not popping up on there. So if somebody was having pain or, or I guess an injury, and I don't know if, I don't know if you deal with injuries because you've made that distinction earlier in the podcast, injuries versus pain. But I think the old methodology for injury recovery was the rice method, rest, ice, compression, and elevation. And that has been, I'm pretty sure, kind of outdated at this point. If you are kind of somebody who helps, you know, with injuries, and again, I don't really totally... I think I conceptually understand the distinction there, but is there a new methodology or is it so individualized that it'd be impossible to just give like one blanket recommendation? Yeah, no, good question. On the distinction of, of pain and injury, I guess that's just the way I always frame it is because most people I work with are in pain, like chronic long-term pain where, you know, talking, tracing back to what we talked about earlier, where it's just so, there's so many factors going into it. I never want to label it as an XYZ injury unless I know for sure, right? For example, I was working with somebody who had low back pain, because they've had, you know, we have like a clear cut imaging that they have a disc herniation. Okay. That's an injury causing their pain. I would say it's an injury in terms of the, the rice method, right? So rest, ice, compression, elevation that used to be for sprains as well as like some other soft tissue mm -hmm. injuries, right? So think of sprain, strain, just general inflammation to an area. People would use that approach. 
and I think it's a good it's a good launching point for everything we talked about earlier in, in terms of how I practice what I practice in terms of what we used to think, what we realize now as as we've looked at it more. And that's just sort of that more passive versus active approach. So if we look at rice, what that methodology was kind of doing is it just kind of it, it really just made you limited and made you sort of wait and just do this and sort of wait out this injury, right? You you have to take a really passive approach where you just you're sitting and resting, you're just waiting and hoping it goes away. Whereas now everything we're looking at is from a much more active approach for injuries like that, where it's, you know, obviously if, if ice and stuff still helps with the pain, they're still like recommending that and rest to degree now it, it's still resting, but the degree of like what rest is, is different instead of, you know, completely bed rest, or, you know, if this was sports, just completely going off all of activity, we're not doing that, but we're instead we're scaling it down and still trying to stay as active as possible. So that, so in, in the cases, a lot of, a lot of what I work with, with the low back pain of, if people get like these acute low back pain and they're like, well, what should I do? Should I just like, should I just rest it and ice it and kind of hope it goes away? I would say, no, let's, I, let's actually try to do as much activity as you can, right? Let's, you know, if you're going to the gym and doing heavy strength training, it's probably not going to look completely like that, right? We're not going to still be squatting 225 or whatever it may be, but we can still be doing some, some lighter squats, maybe some goblet squats, maybe like a, a low weight leg press and stuff. And that's going to still be engaging your tissues and, and more importantly, engaging for you. And it helps you feel a little bit more comfortable. Like, oh, I can still do all the things I want to do. And you don't really look at yourself as, as injured and you don't feel so bad about, about your circumstance. And that, that can be helpful from all the other, the multifactorial stuff we talked about before, right? So like your, your outlook on it, your mental health revolving it, your anxiety towards your pain and stuff, all that can be helped by still doing these sort of active things. And not only that can just can help sort of, it can help with the, the process of the recovery because you are still doing active stuff. So instead of, you know, these older, this older model where we'd rest and wouldn't do anything for weeks, months at a time. And then all of a sudden you start doing activity again, you go from zero to a hundred again, that can just open up this window of like, you know, you're not prepared and then you can run into new windows or new injuries and stuff. Whereas if you're able to do little by little, you know, maybe it's at 50%, 60% capacity. And then you try to, you, once you're healthy again, try to ramp up and do it again. That's a lot easier than if you had just sat there and waited forever. So that's that in a nutshell is, you know, that again, rice was specifically for like soft tissue injuries. Usually ankle sprains is the first one people think of, but that exact sort of philosophy of, you know, we used to want to do these things where we just like it promoted rest, didn't do anything and sort of let it heal versus now stay as active as possible try to keep some sense of normalcy, keep, keep the area moving, keep stimulating in any way we can. That's, you can apply that for so many, you know, musculoskeletal issues, which is like what we, me and a physical therapist do, right? Whether it be low back pain, like hip joint pain, you know, SI joint pain, knee pain, right? Like the whole, we don't have to talk about him specifically, but like knees over toes, like his whole philosophy is sort of based on that. And that's why a lot of the people, you know, he's gotten a little crazier nowadays and the things I, he says, I don't necessarily agree with, but his whole philosophy is based on that, which is a very good, you know, sort of promotion to be making where it's like, Hey, even though we've had, you know, these knee pains forever, the, the, the recipe for getting out of it isn't necessarily just waiting and hoping it goes away. It's actually like, Hey, let's use our knees again, you know, and scale it up at start at a simple level and then scale it up and do harder and harder things. That's actually really interesting. And I'm glad you covered the knees over toes guy, because I had heard for a long time that while his message was pretty solid, there are certain things that he's doing that maybe aren't like the, the gold standard or maybe just a little bit out there. I think one of the things that came up, correct me if I'm wrong, was like the backwards treadmill thing that he was selling for, a pretty expensive fee and, and stuff like that. Is there anything you want to touch on there or should we just move on to the next one? No, I'll just say with anything, like he's just got, I was joking to say he's gotten corporate <laughs> where he just, he has to make money and he's got like his, like his thing. Cause it's a, yeah, he does a great job marketing and he's got to like sell his methodology. I'm just telling you from a, I don't want to say expert, but from an expert in like, this is my field. Yeah. All he's offering and it's not nearly as sexy to sell is he's just offering like, load management of start at something simple, scale it up and make it harder. Don't be afraid of your body. Try to make you feel better. Great. I love that message. However, that's not easy to sell. So yes, and sell, sell like, Hey, like this specific exercise of walking backwards is great. Good exercise. I like it. Is it magic? No. Like, do you need to just buy a fancy treadmill to do it? No, <laughs> but, but yeah, the, the, that methodology can be applied to so many, so many areas of, of musculoskeletal pain, which is a really cool thing, which is like, 
a, a big key component. And like what I try to teach with everyone I work with is like, Hey, this is, you know, just because something pops up, doesn't mean you have to stop completely. It just means we have to sort of shift, you know, your idea of what training or, or, you know, my life looks like it just has to change a little bit, but it doesn't have to stop. Love that. One of my last questions for you is really my last question before we cut it out here. And thank you so much for your time. I'm going to thank you again before we wrap it up. But is let's say somebody hurts their back with a deadlift, Romanian deadlift, stiff like deadlift, conventional deadlift, sumo deadlift, whatever it is, it doesn't really matter too much in this case. But typically that's a load management issue. Like maybe was technique off a little bit? W were they using a te technique that they weren't accustomed to at that particular load? I'm kind of particular about wording stuff like that. But okay, load management issue likely. How would you go about helping them build back their confidence in their body, in their back, especially for somebody who is basically written off deadlifts and not just like conventional deadlifts because nobody needs to do a conventional deadlift necessarily. But if they only have dumbbells and they want to work their hamstrings, a stiff leg deadlift or Romanian deadlift, it's in the cards. It's very likely. So how would you go about helping them build back that confidence? Yeah, no, that's a great question. It's something, it's probably one of the, the, you know, the inside baseball of, you know, like how I try to do what I do and I framework. And it's the, the question I always like to sort of ask myself when I'm, when I'm looking at a situation like that is, you know, what's the hardest thing we can do right now. That's really similar to that thing. So to use your example, cause I've had a lot of people like this where, where it's, again, I don't want to make them feel, you know, like shameful that they are a little hesitant to go back to it, right? If it's something that, you know, they got hurt doing RDLs, that's going to obviously stick with them and be like in the back of their mind, every time they do RDLs, like, oh, this hurt me one time. Like, I don't, I don't feel as comfortable with that. So what we try to do is I try to break down that movement pattern to either a really simple, like the exact same movement pattern, but a simplistic form and see if they feel comfortable doing that and sort of, we can build, rebuild base there. Or if we can sort of move it to something really similar that, you know, I always, I don't like to say I'm tricking them, but I do it or like do an, a pull out, a gotcha. <laughs> but if we can like mimic that exact movement, but it just, if they're not really sure that they're doing it and see that they can still do that, I like to work that area really strong. And then, you know, maybe after a few weeks or so, I'll be like, Hey, have you noticed, you know, we've been able to do this pretty good. It's not that far off from a deadlift you know, or an RDL. Do you want to try doing RDLs again? Right. Example being seated cable rows. A lot of times when people like from a standard seated cable row, if you, I always say, if you take the picture of someone doing that, you know, you're sitting this way, your legs go and you sit here. If we flip you this way, you're in a hinge. You just don't really think about mm -hmm. it. So if you can get people doing those and a lot of times they feel good and they can do those comfortably and we build those up. I'm like, Hey, if we look at that, it's, it's relatively the same picture and you can do those really well. You don't have any pain. You feel really good doing those. Do you want to maybe try, you know, well, I don't want to jump right back into RDLs with a barbell right away, but can we try some other things? And they realize, Oh yeah. Like, Hey, I guess I was doing that. I guess my back is better than I was maybe thinking. Like maybe we can progress up into there and then it's still, we'll still do that sort of thing. So maybe we'll start with like some dumbbell RDLs. Maybe we'll start with doing them on like the cables. Maybe we won't even do, you know, an exact hinge, but we'll just do like some heavy leg press where it still does involve your, your low back to a degree, just not nearly as much. And just try to build up, build up the confidence there. A really good colleague of, of mine, she has a great term. I, her name's Katie. I can never say her last name, but it's like, it's some crazy long last name. So I'd never even want to try embarrassing, but she has a great <laughs> saying all the time where she says, and all else fails, you can't go wrong getting strong. Meaning, you know, even if we mm. can't exactly work on what we're working, what we want to be working on right now, as long as we can work on these other stuff and just sort of help people get stronger and feel better, that's going to sort of rising tides raises all boats. So that's what I try to tell, you know, I, I talk to a lot of trainers all the time who are in the, the field like that. They're like, Hey, you know, my client can't do this exercise, but I want to, you know, like you said, I want to still work that area. What can we do? Just try to find something similar, try to still help them feel like, feel comfortable in the gym, feel strong, feel like they're making progress. I've had a, so many of my clients is the case of, you know, this movement hurts, but I can still do this other one. I really want to do this one, but I feel bad that I can't do it. I'm going to say, okay, well, we won't even focus on that right now. We'll just do this other one and we'll start making progress, like crazy progress there. And they're like, this is awesome. You know, I feel really strong. I'm making maybe some PRs and stuff. And they start to not even like really associate themselves with like, oh, I, I'm the guy, like my back is so bad. I can't do you know, base guard yell. It's like, holy shit, I'm up to like four plates on the leg press. This is so cool. And that's like a sort of a form of, of, of confidence in, in your body and your low back that you don't really think of, but it can be really, really helpful to sort of transition yourself back to, 
you know, certain movements or certain patterns that were painful. I just, I really, really love and respect your, your philosophy towards the human body, which is resilience and like body, I was going to say like body positivity, but that, I mean, I'm not saying you're not body positive, but like, that's not exactly it. But like anti, anti fragility yeah. is a big part of like what you promote. And so I, I just think that's awesome. And, and teaching people that they aren't going to break themselves. They can recover from things. The body is not as sensitive and as fragile as a lot of people might think, or as a lot of people might portray for whether it's due to ignorance or you know due to monetary reasons i'm not really totally sure but so yeah kudos to you before we wrap it up is there anything you want to tell my audience or anybody listening yeah no it's exactly that message you just said because that is really sort of the crux of of everything me and i'll just go ahead and say all my colleagues and sort of the 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 field you know of the evidence-based field and stuff is like that is our overall message is like your body is so resilient and so strong. It can tolerate so many more things than, than we ever think. Heck, a lot of people listening are probably in some form of strength training when at one point in time, they probably thought that was insane. Like the thought that they'd be able to go to the gym and do these things that they're doing now probably seemed impossible. And that can be the exact same thing if, you know, if you run into these, you know, a long-term injury or something like that, it, that can that can sort of shift your perspective and thinking like, okay, you know, I've, I've had this back pain for years. I'm just, I'm never going to be able to do this again. Right. Like I, I've, I've been working with someone he's like, I, he used to run marathons and he's like, you know, I've just kind of written off. I'm never gonna be able to run a marathon again. It's like, well, no, actually, you know, there is a chance we can do that. We just have to sort of, you know, slowly build up to it. I promise you your body's resilient and, and strong enough to actually get to that point again. But it really does start with, with sort of your mindset and your outlook on it. So I just tell people that it's, they should just never underestimate what your body can do. It might take a little while. It might be a little bit of a rockier process than you think, but it is totally capable of doing it. And you should never really write off any, any activities or getting back to a certain level that you want to be just because you think you can. Trevor, that was phenomenal. I'm so grateful. I, you know, you are only the second guest of this podcast. I told Trevor we had, I think it was a hundred listeners. So I, that was let me, I, I do want to make a clarification before my other, some of my listeners get upset and they're like, or just thinking like that, we're not that big of a deal. We aren't that big of a deal, you know, but turns out we're actually talking to a few more people than that because I wasn't looking at my Apple and YouTube numbers. YouTube isn't much, but Apple is decent. So we got like 700, 800 followers. So anyway, but I told Trevor that we only had a hundred listeners and I, uh, and he still was like, dude, I don't care. I'm happy to hop on. And so Seriously, Trevor, thank you so much. I really, really appreciate it. Appreciate you coming on here. Go ahead and give a shout out to people or for, for people who want to follow you. Could you shout out your social media profiles? Yeah, absolutely. No, and thank you for having me. Again, I, I wanted to come in here and talk to you because I love everything you sort of talk about. So I know that your audience already had a certain outlook that, that sort of radiates your perspective. And so I, that's someone I really want to talk to because I, I appreciate all the work you do. But uh, yeah, my social media is on Instagram. It's just Trevor.Zerke, which is Z-I-E-R-K-E. And then on TikTok, it is Trevor Zerke underscore DC. Those are my two main platforms. Hopefully YouTube later this year will probably, if that starts up, I will be posting that on the other platforms. So you don't need to follow me anywhere else. But yeah, I, a little more, we covered a lot of topics here. I'll, I'll break it down this way. If you, if you're more interested in practical, like real life help around your back pain, Instagram is going to be more your vibe. If you want to hear some kooky chiropractic stories with, you know, some, some hot takes and dramatic, that's definitely more TikTok vibe because we have a little more fun there, but I try to make everything practical. So either, either of those platforms. And for the listeners who are in pain or might be in pain in the future, anything like that, how can people work with you? Yeah, absolutely. I have the links on both my pages and my bios. You can just go on there. I offer free 30 minute consult calls, which are straight up. You know, a lot of people are like, oh, it just seems like a sales call. No, I just straight up, I love talking to people about stuff like this. If I can just give you practical advice that you can go and take and sort of help you, that's that's more than enough for me. I just love getting on and talking to people and helping people a lot like you. You know, I know you do a lot of that too. And so that's, those are always in my bios. They're like usually like the only one or two links that you can just book a call and talk to me there. Otherwise, if you DM me, on Instagram, I try to answer as many of those as possible too. So those are always open. And if you have something that, you know, you've been dealing with back pain or something for a long time, you either want to get some advice or, or some expert help in working sort of on a one-on-one -on -one 
capacity for sure shoot a message and i would love love to talk to you and help you out any way i can all right for everybody listening the links for both of trevor's social media profiles will be in the description same with a link to his website and then i'll also throw in a his link in bio just so it's really easy if you want to book a consult call with him it'll just be right in the bio uh, or description of this podcast episode so as always thank you so much to everybody for listening thanks again to trevor for joining us here and we will catch you guys on the next one Take care.